Well, a few weeks ago, I had the privilege of being with you. I didn't know I would be back so soon, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. And if you remember a few weeks ago, we were talking about basically two verses in the little book of Jude. And in those verses, Jude challenges the believers to be impactful in the lives of of the unbelievers, okay? And if you remember, he said, have mercy. You remember that being the the theme? Remember, have mercy on some who are doubting. He says, save others. And remember the hand motion we did, snatching them out of the fire. And on others, have mercy with fear, hating even the outer garment polluted, pardon me, it's the inner garment polluted by the flesh, hating even that inner garment which those very wicked people's fleshly body pollutes. God wants us to be involved in people's lives. He wants us to be involved in one another's lives, in fellow believers' lives, but he wants us also to be involved in saving people. Now, we talked a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, that you and I are never going to save anybody, right? Ultimately, it's only God who can save it, who can save people. But God wants you and me, he wants all of us to be intimately and inextricably involved in that salvation process. Okay, he wants us to be there. He wants us to be actively loving and caring and helping people and being involved in their lives. That's his design. Now, before we look at this document, did, did everybody find it okay? You guys got it? Okay. Hey, don't worry, by the way. Uh, we're not going to go through the whole thing. It's like 15 pages long or something. It is a document in process. And what I mean by that is you may find typos. You'll certainly find uh, passages that you say, oh, why did that appear there? Or maybe you'll say, well, why didn't Tad put this other passage that I know? Or why did he arrange things this way? This is a document in process. Uh, I just began on it, really. It's something I've been thinking about doing, but I just began in earnest on it yesterday and early this morning. And so... Uh, my plan is, hopefully in the next several weeks, to update the document as I have time and, and maybe you know, make some corrections and add some additional verses. But before we go into it, I would like to uh, talk with you all for a minute who maybe have not yet put your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, I don't know the hearts of everyone here. Okay, and really, you guys don't know my heart either, right? We don't know one another's hearts. But if you're here today or you're listening online and you are still in process, you're still considering the claims of Jesus Christ, okay? I don't want what we talk about today to disturb you. I'm not trying to uh, cast aspersions on your faith in whatever you believe. I would, however, like you to look at what the Bible says and consider the claims of the Bible. And is that something that you want to put your faith in? But it's your choice. It's your decision. Okay, so that being said, let's take a look at the document here. By the way, I also have a challenge for those of you who say, oh, yes, I became a Christian when I was, you know, five years old or ten years old or whenever it was, in college, whatever. And, you know, I've been a Christian for many, many years. I remember one of our seminary faculty decades ago now, talked to us in a chapel at at Talbot Seminary down in uh, La Mirada, California. And that's also Brandon's alma mater. 
But this particular faculty member said, you know what? Almost every year, we have seminary students. And now this is not, you know, this is graduate level seminary students that realize as they study God's word, as they hear the professors, as they do their homework, they realize that they were not trusting in Jesus Christ alone. They were trusting maybe in some form of, you know, Jesus does his part and I do my part. We're going to talk more about that in a little while. But they realized that they were not truly trusting in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. And they would do something about that. They would, they would repent and they'd say, yes, I want to really, truly, in my heart of hearts, I want to believe in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and that's your situation, as we go through these verses, I would challenge you, just like some of my own classmates did, to consider your faith. And if it's not where it should be, if it's not in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, make today the day that it is. So let's take a look. As I said, we're not going to go through all these things. What I did was I've put, there's five different areas. I've got them numbered. You could actually rearrange the order of the numbers if you wanted to. You rearrange the order of the topics. This is the way I chose to do it. I only put the numbers not because number one is more important, number two, second most important, but I put the numbers so that we could refer more easily to them and you'd be able to say, oh, okay, now I see where we're at. We're at number two. So we want to look first briefly at who people are without Christ, who people are who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In Romans 3, Paul says, and you'll notice I've got some, some things highlighted there. That's primarily what we're going to look at. That's not saying that the other things around in those verses are not important, but it's what I'm trying to stress this morning. It's all equally inspired by God. It's all equally valid and helpful for us, but it's what I want to focus on. So Paul says, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. We're all together, we're all in the same boat, aren't we? No person alive now or who has ever lived except for Jesus Christ, or whoever will live is righteous by their own doing, not one. Now, people oftentimes are not going to agree with that. Let me explain what Paul is saying. He is speaking not from our humanly perspective, right? He is speaking from God's perspective. God's assessment of you and me and all of us is we're not righteous. We are unrighteous. All of us are sinners. Every one of us. When we look at one another, and especially when people that are not rightly related to Jesus Christ yet look at one another, what happens? We evaluate one another based on what we see, what we know about the person. And there's some people that, oh yeah, that person's better than me. Oh yeah, these people over here, uh, you know, I never struggled with the things they're struggling with. Uh, I'm better than them. And we kind of put ourselves, you know, on the scale, right? And, and uh, oh, I've got a C or better, so I must be okay. Or maybe I've got a, an A minus, I must be pretty good. Okay? People you know, judge each other based on where they are and what they perceive others to be. We also, folks, and I think you'll, at least 
I know this is true in my life. I think it'll be true in yours or has been true in yours. We tend to, you know, make excuses. We tend to make, um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I did that because, you know, my wife yelled at me earlier today or something. We, we cut ourselves some grace and at the same time, we may not give another person that same grace that has the same struggle, right? That's human nature. This point was driven home to me uh, years ago. Uh, some of you know that uh, as I served here at Spectrum, as I served in Richmond, for about 17 of the 30 years I served, I actually worked a part-time job, or several part-time jobs, in primarily IT type of, of things. And I worked for a small company uh, that did embedded systems. And we had a, a, a lady there that was, actually she wasn't a lady, <laughs> she was a woman. She was, she would make most sailors blush. She was the most foul-mouthed, really, person I've ever known. Uh, literally, she could not say two sentences without using the F word or other explicatives, okay? That was just who she was. Something she kind of bragged about, this is back in the day of, of the old VCRs, was she would rent movies and she would come home and she had a, a, a video recorder that would copy those movies, totally illegal. And so she had, a, I saw her catalog one time, she had like hundreds of movies, I don't know why. You know, a lot of them she'd never seen, but she recorded them so she could see them whenever. Okay? Well, sadly, this lady contracted cancer, and she lived over in the valley, and, and you know, myself and actually a former co-worker who flew in from Kentucky, we went to go see this lady, her name is Bev, uh, and so here it's these two older ladies and me, and in the car, I'm in the back seat, and we're driving uh, to go get something to eat over in the Stockton area. And so I'm praying, God, how do I, how do I impact Bev's life? How do I try to bring the conversation around to some spiritual things? And so as they're driving... I said, uh, Bev, you don't deserve to go to heaven. She got angry with me. What? Then I said, Bev, none of us do. But I found that really, really interesting. It was like, you know, doesn't she realize what comes out of her mouth? Doesn't she realize all the things that she's done and the way that she's treated her kids? Uh, things that she boast about, right? Okay, she discounted those things apparently, and I don't know who she was comparing herself to, but she was okay as far as she was concerned in God's eyes. That's how people tend to look at themselves. That's not how God looks at us. Romans says, for by the works of the law, no human being will be declared righteous. This word justify, it's a legal term, actually, that talks about someone, a judge, in this case God, pronouncing that we are righteous, that we, our slate is clean. In Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were spiritually dead. I was spiritually dead. We cannot approve ourselves before God in that type of situation. Again, when we stand before God, none of us are righteous. We can be righteous in front of other people, but not in front of God. Who is God? Number two. By the way, we're walking through these things the title of my message is, We Can, capital can, Share the Gospel. You and I can do it. Is it comfortable? No. A lot of times it's not. 
Is it something we should do? Is it something God wants us to do? Absolutely, it is. As we go through these things, my prayer is that it would equip you and me better to be able to share the gospel, to be able to tell people about Jesus Christ and about his love. First thing is, everybody needs Jesus. Secondly, who is God? He's holy. Now, we also know that he is a God of love, right? John tells us that. God is love. In his holiness, in his love, he's also righteous and just. He cannot just sweep our sins under the carpet. He can't just overlook them. Somebody has to pay the punishment for those sins. Okay, you'll notice I have some verses. I, I'm trusting that you guys will go back and look at these. Let's skip on down to the third point, who Jesus Christ is. God is holy, he's righteous, he's just, he's loving. Who is Jesus? He's God. With God the Father, he created the world and everything in it. He came to earth as a human being. He lived a perfect sinless life and died on the cross to suffer God's punishment for our sins. That statement in blue there at the top, who Jesus Christ is, that's about as clear as I can make it. I'm sure there are other people that could do a better job than that. But that's about as clear as I can make and tell you or tell someone else who Jesus Christ is. In Hebrews, you notice there, uh, it talks about the fact that God created the world through him, that he made purification of sins, In John, a number of times, actually, actually in, the, in the Gospel of John, Jesus claimed to be God. Here in John 10 is one of those times. And he asked, why are you stoning me, or trying to stone me? And they said, it's not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. They didn't understand. He wasn't blaspheming. If I said that, I would be blaspheming because I'm not God. But Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. So the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and others understood full well exactly what he was saying. He was claiming to be God, and he was. Salvation. What how does somebody actually get saved? You know, remember what Jude said? Save others, snatching them out of the fire? Well, they need to know some things, don't they? Here in the blue, in the Bible we find that genuine salvation, that is forgiveness of our sin, involves both repentance from our old lifestyle and belief slash faith slash trust in Jesus Christ. Oftentimes today, this is my commentary, the concept of repentance is either ignored altogether or downplayed. What I see this doing is it can lead to a syncretistic belief system. What do I mean by that? Syncretism is the idea of taking and putting you know, this religion, oh, let's add it to this. Oh, let's add this to it. And it's the idea of, of basically coming up and, and adding to your belief system the beliefs from another belief system. That's syncretism. Uh, let me give you a couple examples, as I have here. 
one example, belief in my good works plus Jesus' death on the cross. You know, he does his part, I do my part, right? Sounds very American, right? Sounds very, that's, we can do this thing. It's not very biblical. In fact, it's very contra-biblical. Jesus is the only one who can forgive us. It's only faith in him, period. Him alone. Another thing would be belief in another world religion plus Jesus' death on the cross. Again, that whole idea of, oh, you know, I'm, I'm Buddhist here. Yeah, well, you know, Jesus has some pretty cool things to offer. I'll, I'll kind of add that to my belief system. Uh, the Lao Kamu people that you guys know, many of you know I've worked with for a number of years, their whole community is very syncretistic. Their history is, is ancestor worship. Then they heard about Buddhism. And they, oh, hey, that looks pretty good. Yeah, we can, we can add that to our belief system. And then Roman Catholic missionaries came in. Oh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll add that also. Okay? Doesn't work. It actually corrupts everything. The saddest part being it corrupts what the gospel is. Such syncretistic belief systems are not compatible with what the Bible teaches about salvation. The Bible teaches that people need to repent of their old thinking and believe in Jesus Christ. The verb repent in the Greek New Testament consists of a prefix, all this is in your notes, by the way, meaning change, and a verb that means to understand or perceive with the mind. So if you take those two ideas, literally it means to change one's mind or one's understanding. The idea of repent in the Bible is the idea of I'm going this direction, believing in, in this thing. For me, it was my good works. I was way better than most people I knew as a kid. I tried a whole lot harder in school, and I helped a whole lot more. And when I heard the gospel that I couldn't, there's no way I could be good enough to God to get to God, that very night, as about a, like 11 or 12 year old, I literally turned, I literally changed my mind and said, I'm tossing all that belief system away. I'm now trusting in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. People who come to genuine faith in Jesus Christ need to change their mind like this and do a 180, right? We're familiar with that. A 180 degree turn from whatever they've been trusting in to be right with God to putting their faith entirely and only in Jesus Christ to forgive them. Are you guys tracking with me? This is the message of the Bible. It's not a popular message. It's not one that anyone else is ever going to share with you because no one else believes it. No one else understands it this way. You know, it's been said that you could put the, the smartest men and women in a think tank and they would never come up with this. The idea of you know, God coming in the flesh and taking the punishment that you and I deserve. Nobody comes up with that idea. Everybody comes up with lots of self-help. That's not what the Bible teaches. Here I give, actually, a nauseating uh, amount, number of verses. Part of it, I was trying to prove to myself to how important repentance is. We don't hear it that often anymore. You can take a look at those, a number of passages there. Let me just draw your attention to one that was said by Jesus. Now, after John was arrested in Mark 1.14, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, 
The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What did Jesus say to the people that were following him? Change your mind. Change your direction. Do a 180 and believe the gospel. That's what God requires. Okay, let's skip over a bit. Skip down to where I talk about faith in Jesus Christ, okay? It's a ways down. So what I'm presenting to you this morning is that repentance, first of all, is very important. We need to change, change our belief system, change our heart, our mind, and put our faith in Jesus Christ. Part and parcel with that, the flip side of that coin is we need to have genuine faith in Jesus Christ. When people experience genuine salvation, their repentance must be accompanied with a genuine belief in Jesus Christ alone to forgive their sin. Now, you can say to me, Pastor Tad, that's really, really narrow. And I would say, yes, it is. But these aren't my rules, right? I didn't, I didn't write the rules of this game. God did. These are not my rules. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And I'm telling you what we need to tell others. There's some churches in this area, and actually everywhere, that sadly... This would be my perspective. I know it's Pastor JP's perspective also. That sadly, basically give a good feeling salve. There are some large churches to people that come in. People that don't know Jesus Christ personally. And it's like they've got a malignancy, skin cancer, this rampant on their body. By the way, um, My head, I'm old and white and bald. Last couple weeks, I have had to put some medication. It's actually for precancerous stuff to burn it off. Okay? My doctor didn't just ignore it. He gave me something that would help reduce the number of AKs, the keratinitis things. Doctor, you can tell me exactly what they're called, but, but actinic keratosis. Thank you. What she said. (laughs) But he didn't give me, you know, some hand cream or something. And some churches, sadly, when people come in their doors, they're giving them feel-good messages. And they walk out, and they still have the cancer. They still have the death because they didn't hear God's word preached. They didn't hear the real gospel. Well, you and I have the chance, as we live our daily lives, to share with people. I know many of you know Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. It's not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay? It's a gift of God. You and I didn't earn our salvation. We can't boast about it. It's a free gift that was given. And we need to let other people know that. Titus, I love this. By the way, Ephesians 2 and Titus 3 are two of my go-to passages when I'm talking to folks. Titus says, When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of works that we have done in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Skipping down to verse 7. So that being justified, being declared righteous by God's grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God saved us not because of good stuff that we have done. 
because we haven't done anything good in his eyes. But according to his mercy, he washed us, he regenerated us, he renewed us. He made us his children. Repentance and a genuine belief in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says is needed for a person to become God's child, God's son, God's daughter. And again, folks, you and I have the amazing, incredible opportunity and, yes, challenge to tell people this good news. There's a lot of stuff still here who people are in Jesus Christ. I would encourage you to take a look at it. We're not going to because of time constraints. But let me close with this. As most of you know, uh, Michelle and I now live in Walnut Creek. And we live with our youngest daughter. Their older son, Zayden, is now in preschool. And he goes to a Christian preschool that's not too far from the house. And I get to take him three times a week, take him, pick him up, take him, pick him up, right? And so I'm trying to build relationships with the moms and dads, primarily moms, that are also dropping their kids off, okay? You know, just trying to look for inroads because not all of them are Christians. I don't know where they stand. So I'm walking out a week ago with the kids, we actually had the little one with me also, and picking him up, picking Zayden up for, from, from preschool. And there's a mom walking next to us, and I said something about have a good weekend. And, you know, she talked about, you know, hey, do you go to this church? And I said, well, no. I said, we're out of town most weekends. Uh, I said, I'm actually a retired pastor, and explained my involvement here. And then I said, do you go to church here? And she said, well, we do now. Oh, really? Okay. Tell me more. Well, her situation was, or is, she grew up Roman Catholic. And she was a very staunch Roman Catholic follower. And Roman Catholicism has sacraments. One of those is, is, first, is your baptism, and first communion is another one. Marriage is another one. But I believe there's seven sacraments. I could be wrong there. But there's X number of sacraments. And each of those, as you practice them, they approve you more before God. And so she steeped in this. And she said, I must have heard the gospel 30 times before I came to faith. Wow. So I tell me more. So her husband grew up in a secular home you know, intellectual home. Uh, he converted to Roman Catholicism for her. And she said she had been praying for her husband to get more involved spiritually with things in the Catholic Church. But she said we were also, you know, we had our older daughter. Now her younger daughter is in preschool. But this a couple of years ago, we had our older daughter in this preschool. And, you know, the people seem like they're pretty good people. and They're a good Christian group. Uh, we ought to check out the church. And so, awesomely, amazingly, they've now come to faith in Christ. Amazing. Two people that I wouldn't think, you know, an intellectual agnostic or intellectual atheist and a very steeped in Roman Catholicism believer, I would not have guessed that they would come to Christ, but they have. And they're raising their two girls in the fear of the Lord now. Exciting. Folks, you and I can have that same impact. The question is, will we? Will we? Will we take those opportunities, those God-given opportunities, to actually say something? And I hang my head in shame because so often I have built relationships. I'm just telling you the truth. I have reached out to people. I've helped them. I've served them. 
I've been kind to them. I've been kind to their kids, whatever. And I haven't taken the step to share the gospel. That's bad. Don't follow my example there. Follow God's word. 